What's up there? Welcome to episode 669, Making the Game Song Ringer. Um, man, I got a lot to share. Lots of things I've been doing. Super busy. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to share uh, the album is now completely finished and mastered. So the, so the soundtrack for Song Ringer will be coming out soon. Um, I got everything all mastered this finished mastering this weekend. Um, 23 tracks. The whole album is gapless. It plays seamlessly together, mixing all the tracks together. Um, there's all the tracks from every one of the dungeons and all the procedural form of all the audio has been kind of like put into a soundtrack form where it's almost like a static form. It's like a snapshot almost of all the procedural audio. And um, lots of awesome things have been done to the, the the quality of the audio too to kind of make it mastering worthy. Let me show you a few of those things actually. Um, especially for anybody that's uh, following along the, the musical side of things or you want to learn how to make music, you want to learn all that kind of stuff. The first thing I did was I, I mixed it, you know, as best I could. So without applying any sort of extra mastering stuff, this is the whole soundtrack right here. This is one song flowing into another song and another song and another song. Each one of the songs has their own track. This is all one big, this is one big huge project. It's almost an hour long of all the songs of the game mixed together. It's harmonically mixed too, so that it starts with the key of F sharp, the next song is C sharp, and so on. So you're using uh, the circle of fifths so that it sounds really good. You know, one key flows into the next, in the next really well. Um, so I got it all mixed as best I could, right? First, which means that um, it sounded really good to my ears playing the whole album through. I couldn't notice any different, any any sounds which were too loud on a whole bunch of different like speaker systems. I used a, a speaker system with a subwoofer at first to get all the bass frequencies well, just right. Um, then I used my own, my good quality headphones to make sure there's a lot of the subtleties of the the mid and the higher ends were sounding good. And then I actually used the shittiest um, headphones I could, which are my like just like iPhone headphones, which actually aren't that bad for tiny little earbuds. Um, and I used those and found a lot of different frequencies where I was like, oh my gosh, this sounds too strident on these tiny little earbuds. But getting it all mixed that way so it sounded as good as possible without any tricks uh, was a really good tip or as far as like just remembering how to master it out. It's been like over 10 years since I made music really, made an album. So um, it was good to remember that kind of stuff. But then, then getting on to the actual mastering of stuff, um, I refreshed my skills, if you, if you call them that, with uh, mastering. And um, I found a few different plugins which really made some cool uh, changes. So I used this thing called Mixcentric from Waves. And I made sure to kind of like add a little bit of it and then back down on the actual output volume to the point where it wasn't changing the actual volume of it and just A-B tested it by turning it off and on until I found something I really liked. That's not really the most important part though. Uh, probably one of the more important parts here is this multiband compressor. So a multiband compressor basically can compress different uh, bands of your EQ range with um, different levels of compression. And uh, mine, my album kind of suffered from having a little bit too much in this um, mids, this lower mid, like 800 range, and, um, and not as much of the higher mids and the highs. So I made sure to kind of like apply a little, this is a really gentle thing, right? There's only like two decibels per one of these range that's even being compressed there. So um, real gentle multiband compression really helps it to kind of like sound a little bit louder. And once again, I did this so that um, I turned it to the point where I turned down the actual output volume so that it wouldn't actually change the actual volume. So you can A-B test it by turning it off or on and it should be exactly the same volume. And then you can kind of hear if you've improved the quality or not. But here's the secret sauce of, of all secret sauces, the L1 Ultra Maximizer. It's not a secret sauce. If you know anything about mastering, you need a limiter. And uh, this is a really good limiter, actually, because I found I could get a lot of great audio punch out of this because it has a true peak domain. So you want to, I did, after doing the research and stuff like that, I found out that um, a good range for what the LUFs should be, the actual loudness units, 
Um, I've, I've set my target for there for around like negative 13 for how loud this album should be on average. Um, but also the other part of that is that you want to have a true peak that's about negative one so that um, when you're when your album gets played back on analog like speakers, um, that it um, it doesn't ever clip. So that's what True Peak True Peak sounds. It makes it sound good even if it's played on speakers versus just played digitally. So um, that's a really great thing. This this limiter is awesome because it can actually limit to the True Peak rather than the actual peak. The actual peak is not as important because it doesn't make as much of a difference for analog and stuff like that. So this is really sweet. So those are those plugins. The album's finished, which is freaking awesome. It's a huge like relief. Um, and then I found, let me show you what the whole album looks like. As far as chopping it up goes, I actually used Adobe Audition um, because Audition can set all these markers And um, right, like there's track one, track two. Let's zoom in on track two here. See how nice this audio looks? Look how uniform this whole album looks. A lot of this is due to the L1 maximizer, but also due to the fact that I really made sure the mix of this all was good. And actually, the album looked good here visually. The waveform looked good before I even did the L1 maximizer, but afterwards it just looks excellent. Because instead of having peaks that hit zero at times, um, you can see that there's a really nice like negative one um, ceiling there. And secondly, a lot of these other you know bits of the audio have been pushed up to the point where they sound nice and crisp and loud and stuff like that without sounding too loud and without sacrificing very much of the dynamic range. In fact, I think it 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 feels like it's almost like three to six decibels louder. Well, I really only lost like three decibels of its dynamic range. So the dynamic range of this album is still like 12 to 15, which is really healthy. Like anything below nine and you start to get like just, pfft, it sounds too flat. Everything is just the same loudness and stuff like that. But this is a really nice dynamic range and it sounds good. And uh, I also A-B tested it with like um, listening to some of my other favorite music. And I think it sounds about at the right volume there. Let me show you one more tool that I found with um, mastering. I bought this this tool, this is great. Um, it's called Expose. And you can drop in a bunch of your tracks, right? And then it shows you at a glance all these really awesome technical pieces of information about your audio. Like um, this first one here, negative 12.7 int. This is the integrated um, LUFs or loudness units. And this negative 9.8 ST is the like the um, dynamic loudness over like three second window. So this is basically saying that this is about a negative 12 song, and uh, that's a right about the range, which should sound good, pretty good on like Spotify, iTunes, even even mastered to a CD. This would sound pretty good. At this about about this loudness, and then here's the uh, the true peak. So this has a true peak of negative one. 0.01 and um, the actual peak is negative 1.1 and then it shows you some um, like left right this is how how much of the audio is left and right in this track and this is the showing the correlation so um, right plus one is a nice healthy stereo correlation minus one would be horrible meaning that you're canceling out your phase and you're losing a lot of sound and you probably don't know it um, without using a tool like this uh, and this is showing the dynamic range. This has a um, this particular song has an overall dynamic range of 8.7, which is pretty low. That's actually this is probably one of the unhealthier songs, but to my ears, it still sounds perfectly fine. And actually, what it's showing you here, if I click on this, it's showing see that little red section right there. That like four second clip or whatever is the only part of the song with this dynamic range being too low, right? So I can live with that. I can live with the entire track being perfectly healthy except for this tiny little portion, right? So these little red marks that you're seeing here, these are issues. And uh, these are all issues I can totally live with. Like for example, this track, 
there's three little parts where um, it's it's audio is mostly in the right channel and it's totally purposeful because this is the song about the hemisphere brain where the right half of the hemisphere is overcoming the left half is meant to be it's meant to be entirely in the right channel um, and then this last little issue, I have no idea, like it, as the track fades out into silence, it's marking it as like a low correlation or something like that. But anyways, what's great about this tool is that most of the time in my past when I've mastered an album, I've used something like this in real time. So you have to put on some kind of VST plugin or something like that, listen to your entire track, watch it like a hawk looking for any issues with loudness and stereo imaging and true peaks and dynamic range and all that kind of stuff. Trying to pay attention to all that shit at once is crazy hard. So this is the ultimate tool because you can drop your tracks in and see at a glance the entire track, like, oh, there's an issue there or there's an issue there. So man, I'm happy with this. But anyways, those are the tools I use to master the album and I'm pretty happy with it. So. On to today's topic. Today's topic is game controllers for iOS. So the game on iOS on iPhones is working great. Um, the touch screens are, all the controls are like pretty much done. Um, but what's left to do is controllers. So I've actually done most of the code for controllers. Thankfully, Coco Studio X already had that. Let me show you what I mean. So um, I already had this code before where you create an event listener for touches. And this is basically, you can just create an event listener for controllers. So it has, Coco Studio X has controller code. And then you get, this is, these are um, MFI controllers, by the way. So that's made for iPhone or made for iOS, something like that. But anyways, Coco Studio X has that all um, in its library. And it gives you these nice convenient messages like on connected, on disconnected, when a key is down, which is basically button, when a key is up, when a key is repeated, or there's an access event. So that's really how easy it was to get this code done. And um, I haven't tested it yet um, because I don't have an MFI controller, but I found this library called Virtual Game Controller which can actually emulate MFI controllers. So I may be doing that today. But first, I want to explore. So basically, my goal right now is to um, try out this, uh, try and get this. I have this controller. This is not an MFI controller, but it is iCade compatible. So there's a bunch of controllers out there that are iCade compatible, as opposed to being MFI compatible or whatever. So I, pro I think I want to try and put both kinds of compatibility into Songbringer's iOS version, um, which means it should just run with the most amount of controllers that it can. Does this look a lot like an Xbox controller? It's not. It's an iPega. You're meant to put your iPhone right here or whatever. I don't know how well this thing works, but we're going to find out. So the first thing I got to do is make a decision because there's two different ways I've found to support iCade. Um, one is there's this thing called iCade iOS. It's a library on GitHub made by Stuart Carney and he implements only iCade in this little library. However, there's this other thing called Virtual Game Controller, which is a lot more complicated, but it seems really like really cool. Like you could actually write an application that would emulate an MFI controller on your keyboard on your Mac or whatever, or you could use one iPhone to control another, or you could use multiple different controllers in one game. Like it's a really, seems like a really powerful library and it just replaces the other GC controller library. So, which comes with iOS API. So this actually is probably what I need to do is implement this um, because it also implements iCade. However, there's one sim one thing I want to check because maybe I don't. 
I should at least read up a little bit and try and understand each one of these because this one might be a little bit simpler. Um, I'm not sure if you need to uh, ask the user for any input, but I think the virtual game controller one, you might have to ask the user what the heck, uh, which, I mean, which IK you're using. And this one, I'm not sure if it does need to use, ask the user for which IK controller. So, I guess I could just try them out too. Yeah, trying them out actually probably would be the best way to go. Okay, let's get. I'm gonna get this uh, controller connected to my iPhone. I got my iPhone 6 Plus over here. This iPega controller. Let's see what we can do to get this at least Bluetooth synced up first. Press and hold B plus home for two seconds, then release until LED one and two flash quickly. Bluetooth, turn that on. Should see the iPega. Oh, what's it gonna say? Yeah, PG nine zero two one nine zero two one zero. No, it's just nine zero two one. Connected. All right. Boom. That seems good. That was not hard. Still says connected? Okay. Well, all right. Okay, how about instead of reading, we just coding, huh? Let's do some code. Let's open up this IK test thing first. Not even gonna read the readme. Okay, did I close up the other apps? I think so, I think we're good. Okay. Unsupported family. Targeted device families. Where the heck do you do that? Oh, there we go, universal. What? Oh man, this project is unsupported compiler.
Okay, we gotta set the compiler to something that. What? Oh. All right, it's actually compiling stuff now. All right, cool. Um, okay, maybe it's the deployment target. Yeah. <laughs> iOS deployment target 4.3. Oh my god. All right, apparently it's launching this test, but I think that would mean I would need to connect to my my Mac. I don't know if that would even work. I'm waiting. Is this ready? What's this little red button down here? <laughs> oh man, this project is so ancient, it doesn't have any clue what to do with all this. I'm assuming that because it was written, it was deploying for iOS 4.3. It's not even retina. So trying to use this is just a joke. I'm not even gonna I'm not even gonna worry about this. Okay, I kit IK test is super old. Which means uh I probably shouldn't even try and mess with this. Let's get open this let's get this one going here. Get a virtual game controller instead. This is probably just a dead end. Okay, there's a bunch of, um, should be some sample projects here. Here's the samples. Bridge, central. What do I want? I don't know. Ah, uh, they got this crazy terminology here. Um, there's a peripheral. I think a peripheral is what I want. The central means it's an app that can use virtual game controller and the peripheral is something that it use like this is a controller. Why don't they just call it a freaking controller and an app? God. So confusing. I think I want this one peripheral OSX. 
Oh no, it's Swift code. Looks like I'm gonna be learning some Swift code today. At least it compiled on the first try. It's only six warnings, too. I ran it, it quit already? What happened? No log? Ran it again, nothing happened. I must not understand what's going on here. Um. Well, okay, Let's go back to the documentation. I read through this the other night. Virtual Game Controller makes it simple to create software-based controllers for games and other purposes. And you need to easily control one iOS device with another It wraps around GC controller. So you can basically implement MFI without even doing anything. So this is kind of like a two-player type thing it's talking about. Rich set of sample apps. That's what I want to see. High performance. That's good. All I really care about here is IK controller. And I guess it would be nice if I had the ability to emulate an MFI controller with an OSX keyboard app. Like I could just type in on my keyboard and be like, that could translate into MFI. That's what I'm hoping this can do. So A, I get iCade support for iOS and B, I can test out the MFI support. Should be ideal. Okay, here's the dang terminology. Peripheral is a software-based game controller. That's what I was hoping that project was I just tried to compile. A central is typically a game that supports hardware and software controllers. Central utilizes virtual game controller as a replacement for the Apple game controller framework. A bridge acts as a relay between a peripheral and a central represents a hybrid of the two. Key use case is controller forwarding, which I still don't understand what that is. Whatever. Okay, here's instructions about objective C, which I'm definitely not gonna use Swift. Says there's a here we go objective C iOS.
Okay, does that mean that it actually compiles this framework every time? Or, I mean, it actually compiles this framework rather than it being something you just include? Once again, I clicked the run button and nothing happened. I'm like, super confused. We need to look at um, uh, this thing's uh, build phases. Here we go. There's no dependencies. Okay, so it doesn't actually build this. Watch kid. Oh, oh, that was the note. Okay, this is what I was looking for. This thing's build phases. Oh yeah, it does depend on virtual game controller iOS. So it does get like kind of built rather than being a framework. Oh, I had the wrong one selected there. Okay. Ah, so code signing stuff. I would just jump on my my account there and fix that right now, but I'm live streaming, so I don't really want to like give away details and stuff about that. Um, I thought I could do this while I'm streaming, but I guess I have to kind of get this setup work done without streaming. It looks like this is basically creating some buttons, which test out stuff. I'm wondering how it tests it though. This is a peripheral. Okay, so this is an iOS peripheral, meaning that, oh wait, no. Oh, it's it's either central mode or it's peripheral mode. I know you could add yes. Huh. Button press. You see elements, all right. When a central is connected to by a peripheral.
Huh. Okay, let's check out that, that what it says about iCades. Peripheral iOS. Isn't that what I was trying to build? Oh, did I? Hold on a second. This other project. Peripheral OS X. Did I have the wrong... I did have the wrong target. That's what it was. Okay. I was like, why didn't it run anything? Because it was... Same damn thing. Wait, do I need a team? I want a code sign. Don't sign. Ay, ay, ay. Because this is totally what I'd want to do is I'd want to do this peripheral OS X so I could test out MFI on my iPhone. Okay, so I want to look at this one. How to implement it in my game. And I always look at supporting iCade controllers. A bridge forwards value sent by one peripheral or more to the central. I don't get why I'd use that. Okay, what does it take to do IK?
simply the result is the IK controller appears to be MFI hardware and simply by supporting the virtual game controller API you'll be able to support IK out of the box dot 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 mostly what's that supposed to mean None of these are the iPega. Damn. Maybe it's just iCade. So you still have to create some kind of in invisible text field even though you're using this virtual game controller API? Gosh, this makes you kind of want to do this other one. Well, I guess I got to kind of like shut down the stream because I got to like get into my account details and stuff like that and do some some of that kind of detailed development work so anyways I hope you enjoyed this video looks like nobody was really chatting today maybe my chat was broken or maybe I'm not even online right now I don't know anyways thank you for watching this if you do end up watching this this is watchable <laughs> uh yeah cheers everybody